Hello, hi, hello, hi. Good morning to um, you from the UK and good afternoon um, to I3L. And thank you so much for inviting us to this wonderful event. It's fantastic to be with you today. So I'm going to share my screen, if that's okay. Um, and hopefully, here we go. Can you see? Can you see yes, my slide? Right now. Yes. Fantastic. That's great. So, yeah, thank you so much for inviting us to join you um, today. Um, my name is Professor Kim Dale. I am a professor of molecular developmental biology at the University of Dundee and the Assistant Vice Principal International. So um, Scotland, um, which is where the University of Dundee is based, um, has been heralded as one of the most beautiful countries in the world. So I just wanted to show you a couple of these photographs um, to illustrate where Scotland sort of sits. So it's surrounded by ocean, beautiful mountains, fantastic castles, wonderful landscapes. And the city of Dundee um, sits here, um, nestled on the side of the River Tay. And Dundee has been um, heralded as being Scotland's very best place to live and it's one of the top 10 most affordable cities in the UK and apparently the most fun place to be a student in Scotland. So where does Dundee sit? So on this little map here what you can see is that little red dot and so Dundee sits about an hour north of Edinburgh on the east coast of Scotland. So Edinburgh is of course the capital of Scotland and calling you today then from the university, which is one of the top universities, top 20 universities in the whole of the UK, and first in Scotland for graduate prospects. But I particularly want to focus on one of our 10 schools at the university today, and that is the School of Life Sciences. So um, these are just some of our recent rankings I wanted to share with you that we're very proud of. So we are top in the UK for teaching in pharmacology and pharmacy, and fourth in the UK for teaching in biological sciences and biomedical sciences, which all fall under the umbrella of life sciences. We're also top in the UK for research in the life sciences, so that ranks us higher even than Oxford or Cambridge in research in this area. We're sixth in the UK both for our publications in life sciences and for spin-out successes, and that's particularly true of our drug discovery um, area in, in the school. So all of that fantastic top class research is in a variety of areas in life sciences, all of which are sort of focusing on real world issues, developing treatments and a an better understanding of processes leading to improvements to health of mankind. So in all of these areas, cancer biology, developmental biology, microbiology, a whole range of areas within life sciences. And all of that fantastic research is what underpins um, our teaching in our undergraduate programs. So we have um, 12 different undergraduate programs. It's a four year degree in Scotland. And much like your degree course in I3L, what we have is for the first two years, a core curriculum so that no matter which degree route you take, everybody studies the same thing for the first two years. And then you specialize in year three, choosing your different degree route. And then in year four, that's when you get to do half of that year, an honors project based in one of those world-class research labs, undertaking a project that you, um, prepare together with your researcher, your PI, your supervisor, working alongside PhD students and postdocs in the lab. Now, not all of our students come to us at year one and year two, but in fact, what we do with our partnership programs is to have students come in later in the program, for example, into year three. And so this is the partnership that we are trying to develop at the moment, a really exciting new program we're developing with I3L. And so the idea would be that students would spend the first two years in the partner institution. So for example, in I3L, 
and then moved to come and join us in Dundee for year three and year four, with the option, of course, to also take an internship um, in one of our labs or, or one of our surrounding industrial partners in the summer between year three and year four. So these programmes mean that students would graduate then with two certificates, so it's two degrees, one from Dundee and one from I3L. And as I say, this is a partnership that we're really in the middle of developing and hopefully we'll be able to publish and launch um, later this year. So those programmes really are designed to really equip students with the skills that employers are looking for. All of our courses reflect current top level research themes that are relevant to human health. And you're given the opportunity to really experience sort of wet, wet lab research at the forefront of bioscience, both in internship opportunities, as well as in honors projects. And those honors projects and internships, you carry out in labs and facilities that really are equipped with state-of-the-art technology and equipment. I mentioned our industry partners where, where those internships might be possible and so some of those are in sort of global companies highlighted here on this slide but we also in Dundee have a lot of spin-out companies as I referred to early on in the talk and these are spin-out companies that are now based in Dundee that have come out from some of our research labs in the school. So again, fantastic opportunities for internships and potential future employment once you graduate. Now I'm going to, um, for my last slide, try and see if hopefully I can get a little video to play. Um, so let me see if this will work for us today. Uh, is it going to work for me? Is that working? I've had four years of wonderful experience and I think Dundee itself just welcomes everybody from every part of the world, so regardless of you know where you come from, I think. Oh. It's definitely been my second home for sure. Scottish people are generally more welcoming to international students and it's just not, not only welcoming but we are we are accepted as part of them as one of them and our rights and you know our welfare is seen as a equivalent and as important as the locals here personally i feel safe in dundee um, people here are quite vigilant compared to larger cities around the uk dundee is a very safe place so my favorite place in dundee it's gotta be the vna museum i've never seen something like that before and I can literally spend like hours and hours just to browse through. My favorite places in Dundee um, would be the Law Hill. I really like going for walks or jogs. So the Law Hill is really wonderful. The views are absolutely beautiful. Um, I also really like to go to the riverside. And it's just really nice um, if you want to go for a leisurely stroll by yourself or with your friends. I was very surprised at how convenient the city is because everything is just like within walking distance. I don't even need to take the bus in order to get to the supermarket or the restaurants or the gym nearby. Personally, I'm a food fanatic. So I do like to go grocery shopping and Matthews is one of the Asian grocers in Dundee. And even though it's small, it is sufficient. It gets me everything that I need for um, making Asian meals. I think the student accommodation here is really marvelous. And also by staying in student accommodation, you get to interact with people from all around the world. I met a lot of friends, made a lot of good memories, and actually some of them have followed me to stay in a rented accommodation now. And it's really nice because it's people who I get along really well with. The cost of living in Dundee is really, really affordable as compared to other cities. And I feel really, really lucky that I do not have to spend like, a lot of money on food and also on accommodation. Almost every Saturday, I would meet with like different groups of friends. We would either have a potluck or someone who's a really good chef would be cooking something for us. And it normally ends with a board game night. And recently, a bunch of my friends have gotten into mahjong, which is 
just know a uh, Asian game that is played um quite differently between different countries, but then we settle our differences um sometimes before the game starts and then sometimes uh, after the game ends. For me, societies really make a big part of my social life, and definitely, if you see a society that does something that you enjoy, do sign up and give it a go. It brings international students or people who are on the same boat uh, together and really keeps you occupied. I've been here four years. I've got another year to come, and I'm still I'm still looking forward to building more memories in Dundee. And it's definitely been and it will be a special place in my heart in the future. I think. Okay, so um, thank you so much um, for listening to the talk and hopefully that's given you a flavour of um, life in Dundee and the courses and the really exciting programme that we are currently trying to develop between I3L and Dundee. And hopefully that means that we will be able to see some students from I3L in Dundee in the near future. Um, so. I'm just wondering, have we got confirmation if Professor Ray is here? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Professor Kim. That was a really wonderful presentation. And yeah, we now know more about the Dundee. And yeah, we're actually still waiting for him to join us. And if it's all right with you, perhaps I'd like to know more about especially the international students club at Dundee. I'm sure that many Indonesian students here would very much be excited to go to Scotland and from your presentation, I see that that is a very beautiful place. And I'm sure that the experience itself will be very valuable for students. Just, I'd like one question that it's been, I've been quite curious about this. Is there any opportunity perhaps while studying there at Dundee, since our students are still technically students, can they get like opportunities to perhaps work either part-time or maybe freelancing there? That's a great question. Yes, no, and absolutely. That's something that many of our students, our international students and our Scottish students, they do do um, part time jobs. Um, and also in the summer, the internship that I mentioned, um, those ones in the labs, they're actually, um, they get a small stipend as well while they're working, which is a really brilliant opportunity because then you're learning some skills as well as getting paid over the summer. And also it means that you can, if you like, try out a lab that perhaps you might want to then apply to do your honours project in. But even during term time, absolutely, there are sort of cafes that you can have part-time work in as well so there's definitely an opportunity to do that and the other thing about Dundee is that you know across the UK um, we are sort of in the top 10% of the most affordable cities so the cost of living actually in Dundee is significantly um, less expensive than some of the bigger cities. Yeah okay that's very good to hear because I'm sure the living cost is also one of the main concerns and yeah it's really good to hear that students can also get work opportunities while studying at Dundee and I hear that Dundee is the top university regarding research right I'm curious whether since our topic is about cancer maybe Dundee has produced some findings I'm sure there are many but maybe you can perhaps show us a bit about the findings that has been going on in Dundee especially regarding research on cancer um, yes, yeah, so probably since Professor Ray will be particularly focusing on that, I wonder if I could also give a sort of broader picture. So um, the University of Dundee really has elements looking at of a whole variety of different cellular processes, which fundamentally, if they go wrong, go wrong, can give rise to cancer. So we're really trying to understand what happens in the normal context in order to then better understand what happens in a disease context like cancer. So for example, I'm trying to understand you know, DNA replication. What are the mechanisms that absolutely are fundamental to making sure that that goes wrong? Because of course, if they go wrong, that's one of the elements that can give rise to cancer. Similarly, in the context of cell proliferation, Many diseases also, not necessarily just cancer, but things like um, sort of, you know, neurodegenerative diseases, diabetes, many of the um, diseases sort of pertinent to um, third world countries as well. So really an enormous opportunity to delve into 
um, you know, different disease contexts that might be relevant or exciting or infuse students when they come. And I think that's what, you know, flexibility within a course can really give you, especially in the context of your honours project, that you can choose something that maybe is looking at a process that perhaps um, you hadn't considered thinking about before you came and joined Dundee. So, yeah, huge amounts of um, underlying processes that will eventually give rise to these disease contexts are things that um, Dundee has actually got world expertise in and is leading at the forefront of those of those areas. And we'll be hearing particularly in that context of cancer from um, Professor Ron Hay. But I think that that's really what's exciting. You know, I mentioned when I introduce um, Professor Ray, you'll see that he has one of the sort of the highest accolades that one can ha have in, in science in the UK, but, and that's being the fellow of, of the Royal Society. And we actually have sort of 13 of these fellows of the Royal Society amongst only 70 PIs in Dundee. And that's why we're really able to claim this um, ranking of being the top in the UK because we have these world researchers at the top of um, at the top of their research um, areas. I hope that sort of gives a flavour of the real opportunity that students get um, by coming to Dundee and doing their honours projects in these labs. And perhaps one other thing I might mention in the context of that sort of living coming and working and living as a student in Dundee. Of course, Will, um, at the beginning, I was hearing about the introduction um, by your colleague. All of our programs and our partnerships are associated with scholarships as well, that either are um, can be um, awarded on the basis of academic excellence and um, accolades, as well as those that you can apply for. So again, really sort of looking to make these opportunities available to a broad remit of students, because we're completely, you know, aware of the fact that these are um, challenging, but nevertheless, hugely rewarding opportunities for students to participate in. Well, yeah, thank you very much, Professor Kim. That's very brilliant. And that's very encouraging to hear that while studying there, students will also get scholarships, especially from Dundee also. And I'm sure that after hearing that, more and more students will be very excited to participate. And we're certainly hoping for more intakes and more students coming on to the University of Dundee. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Kim. I see now that Professor Ron Hay is now with us. So maybe if you could start with the introduction and then we can go on to the main agenda, which is the public lecture on the recent findings of, on cancer. Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much. Thank you so, very much, Professor Kim. Thank you. So, um, yeah, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you um, today, Professor Ron Hay. Um, and so Professor Ron Hay is a professor of molecular biology, and he's actually sort of an extraordinarily distinguished researcher in the context of um, cancer. He holds a number of awards that are listed here. So um, Professor Ray is a fellow of the Royal Society. This is absolutely one of the highest accolades one can um, receive as a researcher in the UK. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and also a fellow of the Academy of, the Med of Medical Sciences. And Professor Ray's um, lab focuses on trying to understand the role of a family of proteins that um, are called ubiquitins, and these are um, little, pro little proteins that are important for regulating chemical activity um, within cells. And so without further ado, I'd like to hand over um, to Professor Ray, who is going to give his talk um, in the context of recent findings from his lab. Thank you very much, Professor Kim, for your introduction. Now I'd like to welcome Professor Ronald Hay, Professor of Molecular Biology from the University of Dundee. Professor Ronald Hay, the time and screen are yours. Okay, so uh, welcome. Um, I shall uh, <clears throat> share my screen.
Okay, can you uh, can you hear me and see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so um, welcome everybody. Uh, good morning from Dundee and good afternoon <laughs> where you are. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you today about is, uh, is, is, is the treatment of a disease which has been uh, remarkably effective. So this is a disease, it's a leukemia and it's called acute promyelocytic leukemia. And many years, you know, maybe 50 years ago, if you presented to your physician with this disease, the likelihood that you would be dead within two weeks, it was very aggressive uh, cancer and there were no really good treatments. But if you go to your physician now, the likelihood is that you would be cured of this disease um, and you would have relatively few side effects. Uh, and so this has really been a remarkable success um, of cancer therapy. And it has not at all come from uh, the traditional route because origin, what, one of the treatments that we, uh, that we particularly are interested in came out of uh, a traditional Chinese medicine. Um, and the, the molecular basis of, this, uh, of, of, of the action of this drug is really the thing which interests us tremendously and which is uh, we've worked on for the last, uh, the last 20 years. So I'll just tell you a little bit um, about what we're going to do in the, in, in, in the lecture today. So um, I want to cover maybe five different components. And so one is to just really bring you up to speed in the, the, the time scale from 50 years ago when the, the disease was incurable to how it's been uh, cured. Um, <clears throat> the discovery of the molecular basis of the disease um, and the function of the key protein uh, that's mutated in this disease in normal cells. And then I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about how patients are actually cured with this disease. And then just a little bit at the end, just to tell you a bit about the research that we're doing, some of the experimental evidence for the mechanism um, of the drug which, uh, induce, uh, for, 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 which cures the disease. So um, the first thing is the timelines from, the, 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 from, from 50 years ago. Um, and in 1957, uh, the disease was uh, identified as a specific entity, a, a, particular type, uh, a particular type of leukemia, known as acute promyelocytic leukemia, or APL. And the clinical features of this disease were that it resulted from an accumulation of promyelocytes um, in, in, in the patient. And this is because the, pro, the, the hemopoietic system, um, the development of normal blood cells um, or white blood cells uh, was blocked. Uh, and so this differentiation was stuck at the stage of promyelocytes. And there, there was a very large number of promyelocytes in the blood and in the bone marrow. Uh, and this caused uh, very severe uh, uh, disease outcomes with bleeding and, uh, and, co and coagulation. Uh, and it was normally fatal within a, a few weeks. So chemotherapy was obviously um, used in, in this disease, um, uh, and, and this was shown to be um, effective. They used anthracyclines um, and supportive care for bleeding, and this, uh, and this helped a lot, but it didn't cure the disease, and most patients would relapse uh, and eventually succumb uh, to, to, to the disease. But then um, what in the 1980s came one of the big breakthroughs. Uh, and this was the discovery that <clears throat> all transretinoic acid um, would work as, uh, to, to induce differentiation of the promyelocytes. Um, and the, as the, dif the promyelocytes differentiated, they, uh, they, 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 they terminally differentiated and died. And this was, this was actually very, the very big breakthrough in terms of helping the disease. So at that time, they used a combination of all transretinoic and chemotherapy, and this was relatively successful. Um, and this was shown to be an effective, an effective treatment. Um, so in the 1990s, they discovered what the, what, why people got this disease, and it was because two genes were linked together that shouldn't have been linked together. So this is the promyelocytic leukemia gene uh, and the retinoic acid receptor. And this was a fusion product uh, which formed an oncogene. And this was what uh, was uh, the causative agent for this particular disease. So the retinoic acid receptor was on chromosome 17 and the promyelocytic leukemia was on, protein, uh, on chromosome 15. 
and they became fused together. And the protein, the PML area fusion protein, acted as an oncogene uh, and caused the disease. It block, effectively blocked differentiation. Then the breakthrough, I, I think, which really um, sealed the cure for this disease was that arsenic, uh, which many of you will know as a poison and which is a favorite thing of murderers to get rid of their, their least favorite person. So arsenic had been used um, in Chinese medicines. It had also been used, um, it was also described in European medicines many years ago, uh, but arsenic had been used as a, as a Chinese remedy. Um, and there was a clinician uh, in, in, in rural China, and he basically gave all his patients who had leukemia arsenic and was able to show that there was a remarkable cure of the patients who had acute promyelocytic leukemia. Um, and this was later confirmed in clinical trials uh, in Shanghai, in the hematology department there with Su Chen. Uh, and they, uh, they confirmed that they purified the active ingredient, showed it was arsenic, um, and then confirmed in clinical trials that this was effective. Um, so what's ongoing is that the mechanism, we're trying to work out the mechanism of action of both all transretinoic acid and arsenic, but the good news for patients is that more than 90% of patients are completely cured uh, with no relapse um, from, uh, from, 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 from this disease. So this, the discovery, the second part of the lecture is really the discovery of the molecular basis uh, of, of the disease. And this was shown to be this, cro this uh, a chromosomal translocation, which fused um, chromosome 15 to chromosome 17. And this is what's known you know, as, as th th this generated, uh, this is known as a reciprocal chromosomal translocation. Um, and so what you ended up in the cell was you had a fusion protein of the, the, the PML gene and the retinoic acid receptor gene um, and, but you also had good copies of the PML gene and the retinal acid receptor gene. Um, and so you can see, you can actually see these, uh, you can see these fusion products using in situ hybridization, or you can use PCR to show that they occur as well. So, so this is, this is the, uh, this is the thing, this PML RER fusion, this is the thing which causes disease. And the reason it causes disease is that it blocks transcription of promoters that would be required to for, for the gene products for differentiation. So for promyelocytes to differentiate, they have to initiate a program of gene expression, which is driven by the retinal acid receptor. Um, and this allows them to go down the differentiation pathway. But in the case of when you have a PML RER fusion is that this, this sits on the promoters and blocks differentiation because it silences transcription. So the cells can't make the gene products they require to differentiate. And so they get stuck in this undifferentiated state. And that basically is what causes uh, the disease. So I want to tell you a little bit about the function of, of uh, this promyelocytic leukemia protein, because this is the protein which we're particularly interested in. What does it do in, uh, in normal cells? Well. This is a protein that's a member of um, the tripartite motif family or trim family of, of proteins. And this tripartite motif consists of what's known as a ring domain, and then a B box one, a B box two, and what's known as a coiled coil. Now the ring domain and the B boxes are zinc coordinating modules. And the ring is known to be involved uh, in, in uh, placing these small proteins, ubiquitin and ubiquitin-like proteins, onto other proteins. So this is this is a this is effectively an enzyme, and these are thought to be structural modules. The coiled coil forms this long uh, dimeric interface here. So you have two of these you two, you have two of these uh, trim proteins together. You can see that they form a dimer, um, and the ring domains and B boxes are down at either end. So it looks a bit like a weight, like a barbell uh, that you would use in weight training. Um, and and this, is what, this is what the protein looks like. This is not PML itself, but this is another member of the trim family called CAP1, um, whose structure has been determined. We still don't know the structure of PML, but we suspect it will look fairly similar uh, to this. One of, the, one of the interesting things about PML is they are found in nuclear bodies. 
And what you see at the bottom of the slide here is, a, is the nucleus from a cell and it's stained, the DAP will stains, stains it for DNA. So this is just outlined in the nucleus, but you can see that PML is in these little dots uh, within, uh, within the nucleus. And th this, these little dots also are, are home to a small ubiquitin-like protein called SUMO. Um, and we know that SUMO is very intimately involved in the process of arsenic and uh, cure of the disease. So you can see them all together, the SUMO and the PML in these little dots inside the cell nucleus. So PML is present in these PML nuclear bodies. They don't have membranes around them. They're a kind of self-organizing entity. Um, and uh, the, the function of these PML bodies has many functions, but they're lost um, in when you have a fusion of PML and the retinal acid receptor. <clears throat> So you can see these nuclear bodies again here. The, 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 in this case, the blue is staining with, uh, with DAPI and the, the pink color is the PML bodies. You can see them outlined in the black and white and they're involved in many different things. And one of the things which, sorry, one of the, uh, one of the things which uh, they're involved in is, uh, is antiviral responses. Uh, there are also tumor suppressors um, and they're involved in, um, DNA damage response, apoptosis, and as I mentioned, transcriptional depression. Probably the most, one of the most important roles is antiviral responses because they deal with the DNA viruses which get into the nucleus of cells. And this will be things like herpes viruses and adenoviruses and, uh, and papoviruses, uh, but they mount antiviral responses. And so they're, they're, one of, the, one of the, the interesting things about this gene is it's highly interferon uh, uh, sensitive. So when interferons are around after a virus infection, the PML gene is switched on. And in these PML bodies, these PML bodies recruit lots of other proteins. And because the PML protein itself becomes modified with this protein called SUMO, um, that acts as an adapter to allow it to recruit many other proteins. Uh, and so these PML bodies are home not just to PML, but to many other proteins, which will be involved in these different uh, responses like transcription, antiviral responses, and tumor suppression. And the PML is not just a single entity, uh, but it's involved. Uh, it, 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 it has a, there's a single gene, but this gene is differentially spliced uh, to give you uh, about seven different isoforms. Uh, the precise role of each of these isoforms, we still we don't know. This is something which is of interest to us. Um, but they are, all these isoforms have the same um, trim motif at the end terminus. Um, and then the, the difference between them is just in, at, at, at the C terminal region. So they have this common core, um, which is present. And I should mention that all the, all the fusions with the retinoic acid receptor all contain this end terminal trim domain, which is required uh, for, uh, for the disease. So there are as I say, there are many different uh, responses from these PML nuclear bodies. Uh, they're thought to, to store proteins. So proteins can be stored there. If they become sumo modified, they can be recruited and stored in these PML bodies. Um, it, they're used to identify foreign proteins. And this, was, and this, is, at the heart of, um, this is at the heart of the antiviral responses. And um, you can see that uh, there are many different uh, uh, things like transcriptional activation, transcriptional repression. Much of this, I suspect, is a sort of indirect effect. It's because you store uh, particular proteins in, the, in these bodies and they get released at particular times to carry out these different functions. So probably um, we'll get on to the, 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 the more interesting stuff, though this is how patients are cured. Um, uh, that have acute promyositic leukemia. So I heard this um, story from uh, Zhu Chen, who was the person who discovered in, in, in Shanghai, he was the head of the hematology department, um, who discovered uh, the, the, the use of all transretinoic acid. And this is a, a very interesting story because the first APL, the patient that was treated with all transretinoic acid was a five-year-old girl and she was in, in medical care in the Shanghai Children's Hospital. And this was in 1985. And she was in really a bad, bad shape. Uh, she had had chemotherapy, but didn't achieve remission. 
she was in a critical condition, had high fever, hemorrhages, um, and septicemia, uh, and 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 was you know the patients the the the, the parents of the patient uh, wanted the treatment to stop and just leave the child um, basically to die in peace uh, because she was uh, she she was suffering, um, but then they convinced the parents to allow them to try this experimental treatment, which was all transretinoic acid. And so they administered all transretinoic acid. After a week, the te her temperature fell to normal. Three weeks later, the girl miraculously went into complete remission. Um, and then they gave her um, uh, treatment with chemotherapy for about a year. And when I heard um, uh, Zhu Chen talking about this, um, she said she's been into remission mission and is now 26 years old in good health and has a has a good career um, and after that success uh, they went on to treat uh, a variety of patients um, and with a, a large degree of success um, and uh, this was really a remarkable um, finding and a remarkable advance for the treatment um, of this disease and uh, you can see that in, in the very first clinical trial there was relatively limited number of patients just uh, 24 patients, but all of them went, all of them achieved um, some sort of clinical remission. So the, effic the efficacy of this uh, drug was, um, w w w has been um, you know, tested in all sorts of different clinical settings around the world, and it's now the standard of care. So any patient who comes in with acute promyositic leukemia uh, will be treated with all transretinoic acid. Um, and what all transretinoic acid does is that it induces differentiation of the promyelocytes. And so in the disease, you have lots of promyelocytes. They're all, um, they're all um, stuck at this stage. They can't differentiate. And if you treat with all transretinoic acid, um, the promyelocytes start to differentiate. And this is because the, the, the all transretinoic acid is able to bind to the retinoic acid receptor component of the PML RAR fusion and basically release the transcriptional inhibition. This allows the transcription of the genes uh, required for differentiation. Uh, you get differentiation, and of course, as the cells differentiate, they all uh, they, they turn to differentiate, and that clone of cells dies. And this is what cures uh, the disease. And you can see effect, you can see this here. This is what's happening uh, 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 at the promoters. So you have a good copy of PML, you have a good copy of a retinoc acid receptor, and this is the bad guy. This is the PML area fusion protein, and it sits on the promoters. It represses transcription, but when you add retinoc acid receptor, it represses transcription because it, it recruits a whole lot of things which are co-repressors. But the retinoic acid, is, uh, when you get you feed people with the all transretinoic acid, um, it kicks these core repressors off of the off of the promoter. The good copy of the retinoic acid receptor comes onto the promoter, and you get transcription and differentiation, and this gives you a clinical uh, remission. So this is really the this is the basis of the cure of the disease: is that you release the transcriptional inhibition um, block. Uh, and you allow transcription, and that allows differentiation. So the other remarkable part of this story um, is, uh, is, is, is arsenic. Now, arsenic has been used um, as a traditional Chinese medicine. Um, it was mentioned in the Chinese Treaty of Neijing in um, you know, two, 263 BC, so more than 2,000 years ago. Um, and it was mentioned by Hippocrates um, in Greece, in, uh, in, in even earlier, in, in 400 BC. So arsenic is a, an, an element that you can dig it up from the ground, um, and it, it, you can dig it up in different forms, um, or pement, or rilga. Um, and white arsenic is what was used uh, to treat the disease, and this is basically arsenic trioxide. Um, and this, this um, has been used, I say, for a long time. It was used in European um, medicine as, as something called Fowler solution in the 19th century. Uh, but the remarkable thing about the uh, ab ab about um, arsenic was its ability to treat um, uh, the the, uh, the disease of acute promyositic leukemia. 
and this was uh, this was in the northeast part of China, and this is at, this was at Harbin Medical University, and there was a group of pharmacologists, and they they were basically digging up this this ore from the ground, this yellow ore, uh, which was um, which was arsenic trioxide. And they mixed it with a, a little bit of mercury because mercury actually binds to, to arsenic. Um, and then they brought in, they, they treated many patients, but the patients with acute promyositic leukemia, many of the patients that they treated with this very crude um, material actually went into clinical remission. Um, and, so, and they had a sub 30% a sub survival rate just with, all transfer, or, or just with um, arsenic trioxide. And then this was followed up, and eventually uh, the group in, uh, in, in Shanghai um, were able to purify the active ingredient um, and show that it was uh, arsenic trioxide, and they carried out a large-scale clinical trial. And this large-scale clinical trial showed that it was highly effective um, in, treating, uh, in, 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 treating, um, in treating the disease. And the, the, in, in some cases, they had as, as high a cure rate as 98%. Um, so this was a remarkable uh, addition to the treatment uh, of, uh, of the disease. So again, what arsenic does is that uh, it induces differentiation um, and ultimately apoptosis because again, what arsenic does is it induces, it doesn't kick the the PMLRAR fusion protein off the promoters of cells, it induces its de degradation. Um, and so it destroys the bit, it basically destroys the, uh, the, 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 the PMLRAR fusion protein. And again, it has the same effect because that clears it away from the promoters and this allows the retinoic acid receptor to come on and induce uh, transcription. And this then allows uh, differentiation of the cells because you've got the genes required for transcription. So again, it's a differentiation therapy. One of the remarkable things that arsenic does is it leads to modification of the PML protein with this small ubiquitin, with this little protein called SUMO. Um, and it modifies this in a number of residues. Um, and one of the remarkable things about uh, this disease, this treatment for all transretinoic acid is that it really gets to a lot of a lot of problems. A lot of cancer therapies fail because they can't eliminate the cancer stem cells. These are the cells which can reconstitute the disease. But because PML is actually required for stem cell maintenance, degradation of PML and the PML retinal uh, uh, RAR fusion uh, uh, actually gets to the stem cells and actually kills the it, it kills the stem cells that uh, that cause uh, that cause the disease. And this is one of the things which doesn't happen just with ATRA. That's why they have to give chemotherapy. So now um, the main treatment uh, for acute promyelocytic leukemia is a combination of all transretinoic acid um, and arsenic. And this is what patients will be given if they go into hospitals uh, with, with acute promyelocytic leukemia. The remarkable thing here is it doesn't the side effects. You might think that giving somebody a poison like arsenic uh, would have terrible side effects, but it doesn't because the doses which they give are so low. Um, and so uh, patients come in, they're treated, and they can go home, and they, they, they actually have, um, they, they're cured very quickly and with very few side effects. And what, um, what I mentioned is the, these LICs are the stem cells. So if you can use arsenic trioxide, it reduces this, it kills this, uh, the, the, the stem cells, um, it degrades the, the, the PML, RER and, uh, and PML, um, and uh, this induces differentiation and apoptosis. And that's what gives you hematological remission. If you just use all transretinoic acid alone, um, you, get, uh, you, you get the PML, RER uh, being uh, kicked off the promoter and you get transcriptional activation, uh, but you don't get the uh, the stem cells being destroyed. So this then leads to relapse. This can lead to relapse after therapy. So, um, the, but if you put the two of them together, you get the best of both worlds. And this then results in patient, more than 95% of patients being cured. And you can see that um, on this graph here where um, all transretinoic acid itself is effective. 
um, and uh, uh, arsenic trioxide is effective, but if you put them both together, um, it's a remarkably uh, effective treatment um, for, for, uh, for this disease. And one of the, uh, the so, so, so you have this uh, remarkable success story here. So if you have arsenic and uh, arsenic and all transretinoic acid, you can see you're almost up to 100%. And, and this is a five-year event-free survival. Um, and so very, very high success rate um, of, 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 of treating the disease. So very good for patients. So one of the things which, I mean, I, I, the, this is work that um, has, has been come from all over the world and the clinical trials have been done all over the world, but um, um, our interest has been in um, what is the mechanism of action of arsenic how does arsenic induce degradation uh, of the promyelocytic leukemia protein? Um, and despite this remarkable efficiency, we still don't really understand fully how it works. And this is the one of the things that we would like to understand because it might allow us to design strategies to target other um, oncogenes. Um, so we want to establish the molecular mechanism by which uh, arsenic recruits proteins into these PML bodies. Uh, determine how patients can become resistant to arsenic therapy because there's a very small number of patients do become resistant um, but it, and, uh, knowing how they become resistant is important in terms of understanding how, the, how arsenic works um, and the thing that we're particularly interested in is how arsenic influences PML modification by these little proteins known as sumo and ubiquitin and how this conjugate is targeted for degradation, because it's the combination of these proteins which actually target uh, the protein, uh, the, the, the PMRAR fusion for degradation uh, or destruction. Um, now, SUMO is added to, is a small protein, just about 100 amino acids. There's a complex series of events which actually lead to uh, conjugation of this, um, of, of this modification onto target proteins. The same cycle is true for ubiquitin, but there are separate proteins involved. I won't go into the details of what these proteins are, but there's a cycle of activation and then transfer onto the target protein. So you form a covalent linkage between the C-terminus of the, of the sumo protein or the ubiquitin protein and lysine residues in the target protein. So the target protein becomes decorated with these small, um, these small proteins. And what these small proteins do is they act as a landing platform for another protein called um, uh, RNF4, which is what we work on. So RNF4 is the thing which actually does the ubiquitination. Um, and I won't, again, I won't go into the details, but these so-called SIMs, these are sumo interaction motifs that allows this protein here to interact with PML protein that's been modified with sumo. And this then brings the ring protein into proximity uh, and allows it, the ring protein is the thing which does the ubiquitination. So you have this combination of sumo and ubiquitin um, on a protein. Um, and I, I won't go into the details of this here, but if you, if you remove this RNF4 protein, it will actually stop um, the degradation. You can actually see the degradation happening here. So these are PML bodies. Um, and if you add arsenic over time, this is just immunofluorescence pictures, the PML bodies disappear. But if you, if you don't have the, the RNF4 present, then the PML bodies, if anything, just get bigger. And you can see this um, on, on looking, just looking at the protein here on a, what's known as a Western blot. Um, and you can see that, that um, when RNF4 is present, this is the protein at the start. And when you add arsenic, it gets, it gets modified with sumo and then it gets degraded. But if there's no RNF4, it doesn't uh, actually get degraded. And you can actually see this, um, you can see this in this, um, in, in, in this little uh, video here. So the, the, the blue cells, um, there's no RNF4 in these cells, whereas the, the green cells, they do have RNF4 in them. Um, and if I play the movie, you'll see that the, the PML, so this is the PML, the PML doesn't disappear from these cells, but it does disappear from these cells. So you can see that um, here the bodies are just getting bigger, but here uh, they're disappearing. And this is really just showing you that this protein RNF4 is 
critical for the degradation or the removal of PML from these cells. And you can actually see the RNAV4 being recruited into these cells um, if you label that, if you put a fluorescent protein onto RNA4. Um, and again, if you, if you look at this movie, this is just, um, this is the movie at the start. Uh, the, the, this is the starting time. Uh, sorry, I can't, uh, the movie's actually not, doesn't seem to want to play this one. Okay, I'll just skip them. It basically shows that um, the RNF4 protein is actually recruited into these, um, into these uh, PML bodies. Um, and this just tells you that, this is really the conclusions. This tells you that RNF4 preferentially binds to, to sumo on, these, um, on the PML. Um, and then RNF4 then ubiquitinates this material and that then leads to its degradation. Uh, by the by the but, but by the proteasome, so it's this combination of modifications uh, on the PML RAR protein that arsenic induces that leads to its uh, degradation. But the majority of arsenic patients that are treated with arsenic are cured, but there are a small proportion that go that relapse and then they present with arsenic resistant disease. And arsenic arsenic resistance it turns out to be due to mutations in the PML part of the PML RER fusion, and they're all clustered in one tiny little bit. And these mutations are undetectable at initial diagnosis, indicating that they're selected for by uh, giving patients arsenic trioxide. Um, and you can see that uh, what, happens with these what happens with these mutations, you can see the mutations here. Um, they're all clustered in this one region called VBOX2, um, and so we think that this may be the bit of the protein which senses um, the presence of arsenic, because to all intents and purposes, this is a normal PML, but it just doesn't respond to arsenic. Now, it forms normal PML bodies, um, although the PML bodies um, tend to be bigger and less numerous in, the, in, in mutants. Uh, but you can see here, this is what happens um, to the mutants. So the mutants, uh, so normal protein is degraded after arsenic treatment, but the mutants cannot be degraded in the presence of arsenic. So they just sit around there um, and they're unable to be uh, degraded. And this is why, uh, this is what causes uh, the disease. Um, and in fact, you, you, you can, again, you can see this with, move, with movies here that you get degradation, you get rapid degradation, uh, but this doesn't happen uh, with uh, the, 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 these mutants. So these are mutants which arise in the patient and the patients no longer respond to arsenic. So what this says is that in the presence of arsenic is that um, under normal conditions, the proteins get modified, highly modified with both sumo and ubiquitin. And it's that that targets them for disease, but the mutant proteins, they're compromised for these modifications. So it's something about the modification um, that um, that is compromised when you have when you have mutations, and so I'll finish there. I mean, I think it's a it's the the story of how this disease um, has been cured um, is really a remarkable story, um, uh, bringing together uh, traditional medicine, um, and tr we're now trying to understand how uh, the, how this functions uh, by. Um, by using the sort of tools of um, a modern molecular biology that we can bring to bear on this. But these, there's just, if you want to do a little bit more reading, um, there are some of the key papers that I've mentioned here that you can, that you can access. And uh, I'll finish there. And I'll take any questions if you have any questions. Yeah. Thank you very much for the very comprehensive and very interesting presentation, Professor Hay. We really appreciate you sharing your intensive knowledge and findings to all of us here. Now, we're going to move on to the question and answer session. We actually already have one question here, if you'd allow me to read. The question is, thank you for the wonderful presentation. May I know how do you initially decide to use combination of both compounds for the study? 
they just start with one of the compound first and screen for potential compound that can complement it? Or did you do something else? Thank you. So um, I, I should say that um, the, our work is not is really on the basic sciences side, and it's not on the on the on the delivery of care to to, to patients. Um, but nowadays, uh, the, the, so what happened was the the all transretinal acid was discovered um, in nine, in the nineteen eighties, and then it wasn't until the nineteen nineties that they discovered that um, arsenic was a treatment. And I think the the straightforward idea was that you have two different treatments. Um, so let's put, the, let's put the two different treatments together and see if it works better. So it wasn't so much a screening, um, a screening regime. It was just saying, let's put them together and see if it works better. And, and it did work better. And that's been demonstrated in clinical trials across the world. Uh, so now any patients who, who go to the clinic with, uh, with this disease will, now, will be given a combination of all transretinoic acid and arsenic trioxide. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, we are still open for more questions if the participants has any. And if you'd like to ask your question, please use the QNF feature and then we'll answer your questions live. Okay, we have one more question. Thank you very much for a very enlightening presentation share the main challenges that hinders the elucidation of arsenic mechanism of action and arsenic resistance thus far? Thank you. Yeah, the, 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 major, difficulty, the major difficulty is that we, um, we still don't understand how arsenic activates the initial response. Uh, and this is where we think that the, 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 the mutations are interesting because we suspect that the arsenic somehow interacts with um, the region known as BVOX2. And we think that that, one of the ideas, this is a hypothesis, this is not, uh, this is one of the hypotheses that we're trying to, to, to work on is that, uh, that the PML protein itself is a protein that puts uh, sumo onto other proteins. So it, put, it eventually ends up putting sumo onto itself. And we think that arsenic may be um, inducing that, um, that, that, that effect. So, that may be what it's doing, but how arsenic actually, in, if arsenic actually directly interacts with the protein, it's still not absolutely clear, but we suspect that arsenic is interacting with this B box in the region where the mutations are, because it would make sense if the mutations then stop arsenic binding, then you won't get the response. So that's, it, it, that's what's holding us back. We still don't understand right at the very first step what arsenic is doing and that that's what our research is in, involved in trying to find out thank you professor hay for your answer is there any further questions related to the presentation topic you can use the q a feature or drop your questions through the chat function and then we'll answer your questions live I see that there is no more question coming from the participants. So I guess that concludes the public lecture on recent findings on cancer by Professor Ronald Hay from the University of Dundee. Thank you very much, Professor Hay, for your time and very enlightening presentation. We really appreciate, oh, I'm sorry. There is one more. Okay. Okay, I'd like to read it. Cancer is an interesting topic. I am a nutritionist, so that I would like to know, is there any food that specifically affect the disease? Perhaps that can be one last question before. Um, I, I'm, not aware of, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, particular um, uh, nutritional um, products that would, affect, uh, that, that would affect this disease. Unless of course they were contaminated with arsenic. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for the answer, Professor Hay. Before we conclude the question and answer session, is there any more 
more questions perhaps from the ITRL students, maybe, or other participants as well. We will answer the questions live, so you can drop your questions using the Q&A feature or the chat function. I'm pretty sure that this has been very enlightening and very valuable for students, especially because, yeah, they encounter this kind of, you know, topic during their studies at I3L. Uh, we have one more question. Can we use a dendritic vaccine to target PML? Um, it, hasn't, it hasn't been tried uh, as yet, but um, I, I think cancer immunotherapy is, is a very exciting area. Um, I think the cancer immunotherapy is probably better suited to more difficult to treat diseases like lung cancer, for instance, because the, the treatment, the treatment, the existing treatment for acute promyelocytic leukemia is extremely effective with relatively minor side effects. So it's really, a, a, you know, it would be difficult to see a better treatment um, at the moment. It, it, you could imagine that if there were an additional treatment that it could be used, for instance, to treat patients who, who developed um, arsenic resistance disease, but well, this would be a very small number, um, a, a small number of patients. Well noted. Thank you very much for your answer, Professor Hay. We've got another question coming. Uh, please allow me to read it. Is it true that cancer cells are susceptible to garlic based on herbal medicine? Susceptible to, to what? Garlic. Garlic. Based um, on herbal medicine. Uh, I, 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 couldn't, so I couldn't really answer that. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I, I think there, there are herbal medicine, you know, I mean, the arsenic came out of a traditional medicine and malarial drugs have come out of traditional medicine. So there are clearly uh, components of traditional medicines which um, are effective in treating disease. But um, I mean, garlic certainly has many medicinal qualities associated with it, but uh, I, I'm not sure um, if any of them would be effective in treating cancer. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. We've got another one. In the case of arsenic resistance in APL, how the treatment would be? Would the combination between ATRA and arsenic still be beneficial? Thank you. This is a very good question. Um, so when, when patients become arsenic uh, resistant, um, it, it, it makes the treatment options uh, uh, limited, but what they will do obviously is treat with, what they would then do is treat with all transretinoic acid and chemotherapy um, rather than, than arsenic. And so they would hope that the chemotherapy uh, would be able to kill uh, the arsenic resistant cells. It's not so effective, but um, that would be the next stage. That's what they would do if patients became arsenic resistant, they'd use chemotherapy in combination with all transretinoic acid. That's a very good question. Yes, thank you for the answer. I see we have no more questions or is there any more participants who'd like to ask? Oh yeah, there is actually one more. Okay, would this combinatorial treatment work on other types of leukemia as well? Again, that's a that, 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 that's that, that's a very, that's a very good question, and um, uh, this is something that we're interested in. Um, for the moment, uh, most of the leukemias that have been tested uh, don't show any efficacy, but there is an interesting combination set of therapies going on because it's known that because arsenic um, actually degrades PML and PML is required for stem cell maintenance, that in many cancers, the difficulty is to, get, is to get rid of the cancer stem cells. And cancer stem cells tend to be very resistant to therapy. But if you treat with arsenic, this can, um, because PML is required for stem cell maintenance, the stem cells no longer act as stem cells and they start to differentiate. Uh, and they can then be treated with other therapies. And there's a, there are a number of clinical trials ongoing at the moment um, to treat other, other cancers where you use arsenic in combination with other therapies which are more targeted to that particular type 
um, of, of, of cancer. I mean, arsenic is extremely effective against acute promyelocytic leukemia because it specifically degrades this PML RAR fusion, but because it also degrades PML, the PML protein, um, and that's required for stem cell maintenance, um, that then what happens is in these other diseases is that the stem cells differentiate and they can then be targeted by the other therapies. And so that's a very good question. There's another, there are a number of clinical trials ongoing to, to, to directly look at this point. Yeah, we have more questions coming in. First one is, are there any developments of next generation arsenic-based drugs that may be beneficial for patients resistant to the first generation or conventional arsenic-based drugs, for example, being able to bind the mutated protein? Thank you. Yeah, again, that's another uh, another good point. Um, um, the, the, the thing with arsenic is that it's a very si simple chemical entity. So arsenic is um, has three chemical has three bonds, so it's trivalent. Um, and to cure the disease, you need you need trivalent arsenic. And so it's very difficult to modify arsenic um, because otherwise, otherwise you only have. To, for instance, if you want, if you modify one of the uh, the, the, the chemical bonds with a, another agent, um, it doesn't work in terms of uh, a therapy for, uh, for acute promyelocytic leukemia. So you don't really have any options in terms of drug development, in terms of changing arsenic. Um, I mean, you can, it's very straightforward to modify arsenic. You can make arsenic, uh, for different arsenic forms, um, but then they only have two, for instance, two valences, uh, which are free and you need all three chemical bonds to be free for it to cure acute promyelocytic leukemia. Thank you very much for the very comprehensive answer, Professor Hay. We have another question. I would like to ask, CRISPR-Cas9, apologies for enemy spelling, has been known for its ability to cure cancer. What are your thoughts on that? CRISPR-Cas9, yeah. I mean, you could imagine, for instance, that um, you, you could imagine that if you if, if you were to to repair effectively the PML RER fusion, this could be done with CRISPR Cas9. Now, um, the difficulty at the moment is delivery because you have to deliver a, 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 a product and you have to get it into all the cells that have got the cancer. And again, it, you know, acute promyelocytic leukemia would not be the disease you would want to try it on. There may be other more intractable diseases. Um, but again, acute promyelocytic leukemia is, is unique in that, it or, or fairly unique in that it has basically one oncogene and not many other mutations. Most cancers have multiple mutations and they're very heterogeneous. So it would be difficult to, 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 to repair it. If, if it was just a single mutation, it would be amenable to CRISPR-Cas9 editing. But um, in most cases, that's, that's not the situation. You have multiple mutations which are involved in uh, driving the disease. So it would be difficult. Um, e if, even if you could deliver the Cas9 efficiently to all the cancer cells, which at the moment would be, uh, would be problematic. But it it's an interesting point. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that, Professor. Now we have another question coming in. Thank you for the presentation, Professor. I would like to ask, would the combination of ATRA plus arsenic be introduced as a standard treatment for APL? Are there any severe or major side effects from the treatment combination that may arise either already found or hypothetically might occur? And how could they be handled? Thank you. Yeah, the, 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 because the dose is relatively low of arsenic trioxide and all transretinoic acid, um, the, the, the side effects are limited. The, there are some side effects with some patients. Some patients have, um, with the arsenic, it causes some sort of heart problems. Um, you know, probably just effects on respiration or, or, of the heart or on, in the, the heart muscle, uh, but that's relatively limited. One of the bigger problems is the um, is that you have this massive wave of differentiation um, of the promyelocytes, um, and this the 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 blood can get very um, clogged up with all these white cells that are that are generated. So as the promyelocytes differentiate. Um, you know, they're, they're all differentiating en masse 
um, into a series of different um, uh, white cells in the blood. And because there's a large number of them, this can cause problems in the blood. But usually that can be treated by the clinicians. Uh, they have ways of dealing with that. I, I'm not sure how to do it because I'm not a clinician, uh, but, but there are ways to, I know there are ways to deal with that. But that's one of the major side effects. But in general, the nice thing about all transretinoic acid and, and arsenic treatment is that the, the side effects are very limited because the doses they have to give to cure the disease are really quite low. Thank you very much for the answer, Professor Hay. I see we have no unanswered questions left. So perhaps I'd like to ask one more time, is there any more question or perhaps follow up questions from the students or those who have asked previously before we conclude the question and answer session? If you have any more questions or any follow up question, please use the Q&A function or type your questions in the chat box. I think no more questions are coming in. So that concludes our Q&A session and also the public lecture by Professor Ron Hay on the recent findings on cancer. Thank you very much, Professor Ron Hay, for your very valuable and insightful presentation. We really appreciate your time and insight for us during this session. Thank you very much. And for all participants, I'd like to remind you one more time to fill in the evaluation form in order to get your e-certificates. If you do not fill the evaluation forms, you won't be able to get the e-certificates. Now, once again, thank you very much for joining us in this webinar of ITRL and the University of Dundee. We really appreciate you coming in here and hope you are all safe and healthy and have a great weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks for all the interesting questions. Bye. Thank you very much, Professor. Hope you have a great day ahead.